So tonight we want to look at four basic questions. Who am I? The same species as God or his creation? Why am I here to bring praise to God or personal exaltation? How do I gain God's presence, grace, or obedience to the LDS Church? Fourth, what is the goal of eternal life, praising God or creating my own worlds? The LDS answers to these four questions are totally different than standard Christianity. First, we will look at the basic Christian position, then the LDS teaching. Number one, who am I? <clears throat> According to the Bible, we are God's creation, not he and his wife's literal children. Our lives started in the womb, not in a pre-mortal life. Isaiah 44, 24 explains, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself. And if you haven't listened to the two previous lectures, uh, you can get a CD from the people at the back if you need it. Uh, but we covered some of this when we looked at uh, Mormon doctrine of God and the no Mormon doctrine of Christ. Zechariah 12.1 tells us, it is the Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth, and who forms the human spirit within a person. On the other hand, Mormonism teaches that we all have eternally existed as intelligences, which may or may not have individual awareness. There's difference of opinion amongst Mormons uh, because the words are used both uh, as the singular intelligence and also as intelligences. So they aren't sure just what that means. But then we were literally born as spirit children to heavenly parents, and they mean literally born. God and his wife, at least one, have physical resurrected bodies. And so when they procreate these spirit babies, it's through an actual birth process. And this is why they all are insistent on temple ritual and eternal marriage ceilings because the hope of the Mormon is to eventually do the same thing as Heavenly Father, birth spirit babies to go on to their own worlds. So we were raised to maturity in this spirit existence and then we were sent to earth for our physical mortal experience. So here you have yourself being born as a spirit, growing to full maturity in heaven, before you're sent to earth as a baby and starting over again. <laughs> Thus, we are all the same species as God, Jesus, angels, and demons. We are following in our older brother Jesus' footsteps, working towards our own exaltation. In the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, we read, just as God organized pre-existing matter to create the universe, so he organized pre-existing intelligence to create the spirits that eventually became human beings. And that's in volume one of the Encyclopedia of Mormonism. Thus Jesus has, as well as everyone else, once been part of the intelligences that were formed into spirit bodies that were born to Heavenly Father and Mother and then later were born on earth as mortals. Do you get that? We, they, sometimes they talk about us being eternal, that we're as eternal as God. What they're meaning is our intelligence, whatever you define that as, has always existed. And so at one point we as intelligences were formed by God and his wife into spirit beings, and they don't explain how the intelligence get inside the spirit beings, but anyways. And then we came out as spirit babies, grew to maturity. They had the council in heaven, the war in heaven, and we were sent to earth. And uh, so Jesus and us are in the same process. He's just further along in the process than us. But the difference between Jesus and us is a matter of time and effort. 
However, the Bible tells us that Christ alone preexisted, not man. Jesus declared in John 8, 58, Very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. And this would go against the Mormon idea that Abraham and Jesus, both at one time, were intelligences that then were made spirits and then came to earth. Jesus declares he's before Abraham. And whatever way you want to define before, he still was before. So that uh, you can't have uh, them be the same species with the same potential. Mortals, on the other hand, begin life on earth and become adopted into the family of God through faith. John writes in John chapter 1, verse 12, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We see throughout the New Testament, becoming a child of God is a matter of faith, putting our trust in Christ. It does not have to do with a literal family uh, inheritance of being the same species. Paul informs us in Romans 8, 14 through 15, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Again, it's an adopted relationship. In some sense, I think of like my dog uh, is adopted into my family and he enjoys all the rights of a son. Well, he actually probably has more rights than my son. (laughs) But he is not my child. (laughs) And we're totally different species. And so it is with God and us. He allows us to be in his presence and to enjoy his family relationship. But we're not the same species. Another interesting quote is John 3, 12, and 13, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Notice that only Jesus descended from heaven, not all of humanity. From this we conclude that none of us had a prior life in the pre-mortal state. One of the complaints against Jesus was that he claimed to come from heaven. And then we go to slide number two. In John 6, 40 through 47, Jesus taught, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, This is... Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling amongst yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone has heard the father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the father except the one who is from God, Only he has seen the Father. Very very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. Look at the last part. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. If Mormonism were true, Jesus would have said something about all of us living with Heavenly Father prior, prior to mortality. We would have all come down from the Father. But Jesus makes it very clear he's the only one that has. Mormonism insists that we had a prior life in the presence of God. Speaking at the October 2016 LDS conference, Apostle Dieter Uchtdorf stated, Brothers and sisters, we are eternal beings without beginning and without end. We have always existed We are the literal spirit children of divine, immortal, and omnipotent heavenly parents. We come from the heavenly courts of the Lord our God. We are the royal house of Elohim, the most high God. We walked with him in our pre-mortal life. 
And that's a talk he gave, oh, how great is the plan of our God. But it's a plan that comes through Joseph Smith. It's not a plan that we see in reading the Bible. In fact, it's not a plan we would get from reading the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith's theology evolved. What he started out with in 1830 isn't what he ended up with by 1844. And all these teachings of this uh, evolution of spirits to gods is a late teaching of Joseph Smith. Which brings us to our second point. Why am I here? To bring praise to God or to achieve personal exaltation? God declared in Isaiah 43, 7, that we were created for his glory. Then in verse 21, he asks, he adds, the people I formed for myself that they may proclaim my praise. We are here to bring glory to God, not to advance our own agenda, not for us to become a God that will then go off and make our own world with people that will worship us. And I know some Mormons object to that. They say, oh no, we won't worship them. Well, what do you think you're going to be doing if you're running your world? Uh, it would have to follow that if we're doing the same thing the father did, then our children would worship us. Well, they worship the husband. The women don't get worshipped. In fact, they hardly get mentioned. But uh, anyways, for you guys, that's the goal. <clears throat> Peter also wrote about our lives bringing glory to God. In 1 Peter 4.11 if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Again, we see completely through the Bible, everything points to the glory of God, not to personal advancement. Granted, God calls us to live a life uh, honoring to God, but we are sinners failing every day and are not worthy of praise. Only God is. In Mormonism, this life is for us to perfect ourselves so that we may advance to Godhood. Number three. We cannot understand. I can't see it. Okay. Okay. This is uh, in the August 2006 copy of the Enzyme Magazine, official Mormon publication. They have an article entitled, The Fullness of the Gospel, the Purpose of Life. In it we read, We cannot understand the purpose of this mortal life, why we are here, unless we first understand who we are, where we came from, and what our eternal destiny is. These truths found in the scriptures and restored through the prophet Joseph Smith teach us that we are literal spirit children of God, that we lived with him in a pre-mortal existence, and that we have within us the seeds of Godhood, the potential to become like him. If the goal is to become like him, then we are planning on having 20 billion or so spirit babies that will come to an earth who will then pray to the, to the man in the couple uh, and then hopefully advance themselves onto godhood and complete the cycle again. As Christians, we know that our salvation is fully a work of grace, not something we strive towards. We are called to live God-honoring lives, but not to advance our status but for his glory. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 1.9, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. In Acts 16.29-34, we read about the jailer, and Paul and Silas, in verse 29, it starts out, The jailer called for lights and rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. 
Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. So what did the jailer have to do to be saved? Nothing was said about the need for temple ordinances or that immortality was different than eternal life. There was no distinction made on saved being different from eternal life. In the New Testament, eternal life and salvation are used synonymously. In Mormonism, salvation is used differently than eternal life. Salvation just relates to Jesus' death on the cross to pay for Adam's sin, but then for individual salvation, we have to uh, obey all of the ordinances of Mormonism to have eternal life. So they separate the two. But now God calls us after coming to Christ to share the good news of his grace with others. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making this appeal through us. We implore you in Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God." The message of the New Testament is that we are sinners in need of a Savior. We were not righteous. And so as Christians, we have Christ's righteousness as our covering before God. But it is not a righteousness that we deserved or that we earned. Joseph Smith preached a very different gospel than Paul. Preaching in 1844, he said, here then is eternal life, to know the only wise and true God, and you have got to learn how to be gods yourselves, and to be kings and priests to God, the same as all gods have done before you, namely by going from one small degree to another and from a small capacity to a greater one. This thought runs all through the history of Mormonism. All of the prophets since Joseph Smith have taught the same thing, that man can advance to godhood. Spencer W. Kimball, 12th president of the LDS Church, taught that hundreds of thousands of LDS men would possibly become gods. Speaking in a conference some years ago, he said, brethren, and I think this was to the uh, men's uh, Saturday night meeting, uh, you know, they, they have their regular conference and then Saturday night they have one for the priesthood. Um, and so there's a special to the men. Brethren, 225,000 of you are here tonight. I suppose 225,000 of you may become gods. There seems to be plenty of space and they're out there in the universe. And the Lord has proved that he knows how to do it. I think he could make or probably help us to make worlds for all of us. For every one of us, 225,000. Again, that's not the gospel I read in the New Testament. When Kimball speaks of becoming gods, that is a promise held out to only the most faithful, obedient Mormon who has had a temple marriage. As an aside, I find in talking with Mormons, a lot of them don't understand that simply being baptized a member of the LDS Church gives them eternal life or gives them eternal families. I think there's a kind of street Mormonism that assumes just being a Mormon gets them families forever. But if you read their literature, the only ones that are gonna be in the family unit are the very top of the most active Mormons who do everything required of them. And no one knows what that is. No one knows if they've made it or done all those things. This isn't the picture I see with Jesus, 
When he was asked about marriage in heaven, he responded in Luke 20, The people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. The application of the word, they are God's children, is something we have by adoption, not by literal birth. It is given to us as Christians, but it says that we will be his children in the resurrection. We will be the family of God. We are called to a life of unity of all the believers together, not of singular, singular units of husband and wives scattered throughout the universe, making additional worlds. If our goal is Godhood, how are we to accomplish this? This brings us to the third point. How do I gain eternal life? Is it through grace or obedience to Mormonism? In 1 John 5, 11 through 13, we read that eternal life is received through faith in Christ. Quote, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. As Christians, we have this assurance. We already know what our destiny will be. But the average Mormon is not sure. You ask the average Mormon, if you died this instant, do you know for a surety that you would have the best God had for you? And most of them will tell me they aren't sure. They're hoping, uh, they're working at it. Uh, well, okay, who around you do you know has an assurance of Godhood? Well, and some of them will say, uh, well, I think my dad or my state president, surely the prophet or somebody, but it's never individual. They, they aren't sure that they personally have eternal life. They know they have immortality, the ability to live forever, to go to some level of heaven, but they are not sure that they have eternal life. For the Christian, there is this comfort, this assurance that our faith in Christ gives us that eternal life. While Mormons are concerned with keeping all of their church's rules and ordinances, the Christian realizes that he's a sinner saved by grace, that he has no righteousness of his own, that he needs God's grace and forgiveness. Paul wrote in Romans 4, 2 through 8, If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So we have all through the Bible, we're made right with God through faith, not because of some uh, set of rules that we have uh, checked off and accomplished. It goes on further in Romans. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. See, and that's where you get into the works things. Because then grace is a gift, but the Mormon is not truly talking about grace. They're talking about obligation. I did X, Y, Z for God, therefore God will give me eternal life. It's like a contract. How the, uh, Paul goes on, however, to the one who does not work but trust God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will not count against them. And yet in Mormonism... They have a huge list of what you have to do to achieve this exaltation. Uh, if you look in the back of uh, Gospel Principles, the last chapter on exaltation, it has a list of some of the requirements, and that includes uh, full tithing, uh, attendance at your meetings, supporting the brethren, 
uh, temple ordinances and work, uh, word of wisdom, uh, I forget the list, but it goes on and on, all the things that you would have to do to be sure you had eternal life. I have met Mormons that tell me they, they really believe they've got it, which always just kind of takes my breath away. When we first left Mormonism, we had a friend that was fully active as a Mormon, and a real nice guy, but he would come over and try to draw us back to the church and would talk to him about eternal life, and he would just get so excited. He says, but, but can't you just see we're going to be gods? And he, I mean, he really believed this. He was so excited that he knew he was going to have godhood. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, uh, I think of the um, uh, two men at the temple praying and uh, the one man says, Lord, I thank you. I'm not like this sinner over here. And the other guy's beating his chest. Uh, God have mercy on me, you know, and he knows he's a sinner. Well, which one did Jesus say was justified? Not the man that boasted that he kept all the law. It was the man that recognized himself as a sinner falling short of the glory of God. In the Gospel of John 3.36, we read, The one who believes in the Son has eternal life. The one who rejects the Son will not see life, but God's wrath remains on him. Further on in John, in um, chapter 6, verse 28, Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Okay, here's Jesus' chance to give him the list. And all the requirements, like at the back of Gospel Principles. What does Jesus say? The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Mormons will say, well, that's too simple. But that's the whole point. If you're totally bankrupt and someone walks in and says, I'm going to pay your debt, oh, well, that's too simple. I've got to do something for this. No, the whole point is you're bankrupt. <laughs> and for you to say, oh, I want to pay a penny, it's an insult to the man that's going to pay off your whole debt. And so for us to think that we're bringing something to the table by saying, oh, well, yes, but I kept the word of wisdom and I went to every meeting is this going to impress God when we fail him every other day? Maybe one day we did those things, but the other days we didn't. So where is boasting? Ah. Let's see. However, in Mormonism, the work of God is obedience to all their ordinances, rituals, and prophets. Also, they make a distinction between being saved and having eternal life. They believe practically everyone will be resurrected or saved to enter one of three levels of heaven. The bottom two refer to those who receive immortality, but this is not the same as eternal life. That is reserved for those in the highest of the top heaven, the celestial kingdom, and can only be achieved by full obedience to the LDS faith. Mormon apostle Dilbert L. Stapley taught, this guy that lived back when I was a lot younger. <laughs> Anyways, he was an apostle speaking uh, at conference. The Lord has revealed in this dispensation that our rewards in the eternities are predicated on our level of obedience. Personally, I find that very discouraging. Uh, anyways. If we are fully obedient to celestial law, notice he says fully obedient to celestial law, fulfilling the laws of Christ, we will be worthy of a celestial glory. But for those who do not fully comply with celestial law, other lesser degrees of glory have been prepared. Separate my pages. <laughs> okay, we're going to go to the chart. This chart is um, one I bought at Deseret Bookstore many moons ago when I was a Mormon. I thought it was so neat because it just portrayed the Mormon plan 
of eternal progression, uh, and they had had similar kinds of charts in seminary and institute, but uh, they weren't colored. And uh, so this one, I thought, wow, that looks really neat. I'm going to get one of those. Um, on the table over there with the free papers, there's a page that's uh, called Terminology Differences, which I encourage you all to get one because it'll help you understand how Mormonism has redefined all the Christian words. But on the back of that is uh, my drawing of the eternal progression chart, which uh, has a few differences than this one. But I'm going to go over the Mormon one. So when it says realms of deity, spirit life, and first estate, that's all referring back to this time when first we were intelligences as part of this eternal supply of something, of all the intelligence, all the intelligence, the, the personhood, mind of all the people that will ever be. And I don't know how, they don't know how to define this, but it's real stuff. And this eternal supply of matter that's out there that all the gods draw from to make their spirit children, this is a process that's been going on forever, and they say will go on forever, that our father had a mom and dad, when, and he was, our God was once on an earth, and rose to uh, full maturity, died, went to heaven, spent, we don't know how long it takes to uh, become a god. And then he and his wife or wives set up uh, the spirit realm for his uh, family group. And he starts giving, he and his wife give birth to these billions of spirit children. Now, when Mormons talk about families are forever, I want you to understand what they mean. They mean children are forever, in Doctrine and Covenants section 132, which is the section that talks about polygamy, but it says in there that it talks about eternal, we will have eternal lives, not life, like in the New Testament, not eternal life, but those that reach exaltation will have eternal lives. Why is it plural? Because that's what it, what it means. They are planning to have billions and billions of spirit children birthed to them, literally, in some other area to send to their world to become humans who will go through an earth testing and then uh, go to a judgment and then go to some level of these heavens. So when you're born on earth, uh, you're born according to merit. Now, they've softened this over the years because this is where their doctrine of racial attitudes came in that I was raised with that they're now trying to act like never happened. But uh, we were taught that in this pre-earth experience, all of God's children came together for a meeting. Uh, I want you to think about it. We're talking literal. We're not talking allegory here. Literally. Billions of spirits all came together for a meeting. And when I say spirit, we're talking about matter. We're not talking about some ethereal smoke or something. Spirit bodies are matter and size and dimension. It's a more, they say, a more refined matter. But when we say that, when they say that God and his wife gave birth to these spirit babies, we're talking about real births here and real bodies that are growing up in this prior life. Then they had this uh, family meeting, which kind of boggles the mind. But they have this family meeting, and the two oldest brothers, who are Jesus and Lucifer, come before the Father to propose how to run the world. Jesus wants there to be no free agency and to save everyone. Jesus says uh, he wants free agency, and only those that obey will come back to the presence of the Heavenly Father. God chooses Jesus' plan, rejects Lucifer. Lucifer's plan, uh, he gets... Uh, one third of God's children to go with him and they start a war against the two thirds that are going to stay with Jesus. Of the two thirds that stayed with Jesus there was differences in how valiantly we fought in the war because we were all supposed to be there. And in my patriarchal blessing that they give to you usually as a teenager it, it says in there usually about that it says something about you being valiant 
in the pre-existence. And I can't, so mine, uh, of course, my stake president, uh, I mean the patriarch that interviewed me, he talked to me for a while ahead of time. So he already knew that I was, a, I told him I was a descendant of Brigham Young and uh, uh, my folks were married in the tem Salt Lake Temple and all this stuff. So of course my blessing comes out that I am born to this uh, a great lineage and uh, uh, that I'm a chosen daughter who's performed valiantly in the pre-earth life. And of course, I'm a direct descendant of Ephraim. Uh, they declare your lineage. But in this is a concept of, um, it brings in a concept of race. Because if you're born on earth according to the merit you acquired in the pre-earth life, then everyone was sent to earth in the way they were born according to what they deserved. So that those of us born in good Mormon families had this ego trip about how much better we were in the pre-existence than the rest of you that weren't born Mormon because obviously you didn't perform as good because you didn't earn the right to come out a Mormon. This also brings us to race. Because of this, they said that some people were kind of half-hearted in this war and didn't do as good a job. And so God says, well, they don't get as good a birth situation. And so this brings a superiority to the white Mormon, pioneer-bred, <laughs> old-line Mormon, that looks on other races as being people that did not perform as well in the pre-earth life. This is how they developed their doctrine of blacks not getting the priesthood. Because this pre-existent war, they said in the categories of the really good achievers in the war to the ho-hum crowd, that the ho-hum ones, God says, okay, you guys didn't do a very good job in this, so you're gonna have to wait to get priesthood and temple ordinances till all the better performers have a shot at it. And the, of course, the problem is we don't know who those people were because we forgot everything. So how do we know who wouldn't get priesthood? And so when Cain kills Abel, God decrees that the mark on Cain is Negroid features and all of his descendants will be the Negro race. And all you have to determine is who is African black because this didn't apply to Maoris in Australia. Go figure. But uh, it applied to African blacks that they were not to receive the priesthood till all the rest of God's children had a chance. Because of this doctrine that was, and they don't want to say doctrine, it was a doctrine. Uh, because of this, when they gave priesthood to blacks in 78, many people felt that the church had gone into great error because the apostles had always said they couldn't get, blacks couldn't have priesthood until everyone else was born and had a chance. Obviously, we still had white babies being born, so all the white Mormon babies being born shown that all the top spirits hadn't had a chance yet, so blacks shouldn't have been given the priesthood yet. And so at the time in 78, the polygamists put a great big full-page ad in the Tribune uh, denouncing the church for going against the teachings of the prophets and jumping the gun and giving the priesthood too soon. Well, now that's all forgotten, uh, and here we are, how many years are we? Is it 40, 50 years, 40? Uh, for, this is coming up in June, the 40th anniversary of the Mormons giving priesthood to blacks. Uh, with that many years going by, many Mormons today don't even know this ever happened. And young boys out on missions, they don't know anything about this. They uh, were born way after all of this. But I can tell you from my own personal experience, this was real doctrine real teaching in uh, Southern California where I grew up. We, had, uh, we were aware in my ward of a young man in Los Angeles whose family joined the Mormon church. And when they got all excited about doing work for the dead for their families and doing their genealogy, they found out that there was a black in the lineage uh, a couple of hundred years ago back in Georgia or somewhere. And uh, the church stripped the family of the priesthood. And the buzz went around through the stake about this poor teenage boy 
that was suddenly stripped of priesthood and made an embarrassment in the Mormon community. Uh, I mean, he looked white. There, there was no reason to suspect that he had any Negro ancestry, and yet he was stripped of his priesthood. So, the, I mean, this was not just a casual thing. <laughs> this affected people's lives. Anyways, back to the chart. So when you're born, you get born to your second estate here on earth according to merit. And then you have to hope that the Mormons come by and give you the gospel so you can join and get on the freeway to heaven. So here you have the three levels of heaven laid out. Everyone going to these three kingdoms would be considered to have immortality, which they define as the ability to live forever, but that's not the same as eternal life. So after the thousand-year reign of Christ, when they hope to get all the temple work done for everybody, uh, then comes the judgment, and then you'll be assigned to one of these three kingdoms. The Telestial Kingdom... They believe, it says the low way, and the little signs there, you may not be able to read them, but it says the dishonest liars, sorcerers, adulterers, and whoremongers. And then it shows these fires of hell, it says a thousand-year detour through hell. That's because Jesus will reign for a thousand years, and the people going to the lower kingdom will spend a thousand years in some kind of mental torment uh, because they never accepted Mormon gospel. Uh, th uh, by the way, that's where I'm supposed to go. Uh, <laughs> because uh, I'm one of the liars, <laughs> one of the dishonest liars there. So then the broad way is the middle kingdom, terrestrial kingdom. And the little signs say, the good and honorable, but blinded by the craftiness of men. The next one says, not valiant in the testimony of Jesus and those who died without law. In other words, you didn't come into uh, the Mormon system. And you go to the terrestrial kingdom. Now, the celestial kingdom, uh, I think even a lot of Mormons have this idea that, that the, if you make the celestial kingdom, you've got eternal life, but it's not quite that defined. They even divide the celestial kingdom into three parts. So the entrance to the third kingdom, it says on the little freeway sign, repentance, let's see, faith, repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost. Now they mean baptism into the Mormon church and receiving the Holy Ghost through their priesthood. Your Christian baptism is not sufficient. If you become a Mormon, you have to be rebaptized. So then you get on the straight path, and then it has these little signposts. Morality, loyalty, tithing, word of wisdom, duty, celestial marriage. Now you notice that it breaks off into three levels, one, two, three. And the top one that goes to number one is celestial marriage. Those are the ones that have eternal life and that go on to godhood. The others will be in the presence of God, but they will not have eternal life because eternal life is respelled lives in section 132. To have eternal lives is to have temple marriage and procreation of spirit children forever. Then when you make it to number one, you and your resurrected wife uh, will take, we don't know how long, to progress to godhood, and at that point, the man and woman will go over to where it says realms of deity. They will take from the uh, infinite supply of intelligences to form their spirit children, and the man and woman will have to give birth to spirit babies. Billions of spirit babies. This is one of the arguments for polygamy. Because if a man has a hundred wives, he's going to get the spirits born for his world a hundred times faster than the man that's doing it with one wife. Mormons will say to me, that's old stuff, we don't believe that anymore. They do believe it, 
The current president of the Mormon church has two wives sealed to him. He outlived his first wife, married another woman in the temple, and he believes he will have both women in the celestial kingdom. So he's going to get there twice as fast as the rest of the guys nowadays that can only have one. This raises a curious problem in Mormonism today of Mormon women fearing that if they die first, their husband will take another wife, which shows you that it is not a dead doctrine. It's just a postponed practice. Because if the man outlives the wife, he gets to marry again, and he will be a polygamist in heaven. And it only makes sense if you really believe that you had to have 20 billion spirit babies that you'd want to have more than one wife to do it with. And this is why it only applies to having more women, not more men, because it doesn't matter how many men a woman has. She's not going to have any more babies than one every nine months or whatever. But if a man has a bunch of wives, he can have a lot of children in the same time as one woman having one child. That is the Mormon plan. They call it the plan of happiness. They do not give out this kind of detailed chart anymore. The charts they put out now are very uh, brief. They'll just show pre-earth, then earth, and then three levels of heaven because they don't want you to think about it. <laughs> they don't want you to get the details. It is not the program that I see in the New Testament. The oldest manuscripts of the New Testament Teach, teach the same thing as they've always taught. And Mormonism was never there. They want to argue that the New Testament was so changed that you don't see Mormonism today because the good stuff was taken out. But there's no evidence for that. If, I mean, I could just make up, a, well, you know, uh, if you had the originals of uh, the New Testament, there really was a prophecy about this false prophet in the last day that would be named Joseph Smith. Uh, but since no one knew what that meant, they just took that part out. I mean, if you get to make it up and you don't have to have any proof, you, you could say the New Testament taught anything. The oldest manuscripts say the same thing as today. The early church fathers quote the uh, books of the New Testament that say the same thing. There's no evidence of this kind of revision. Uh, Mormonism is not in the early Christian church, the New Testament is reliable in determining what the New Testament church was about and what they were teaching. Paul wrote in Romans 1, 16 through 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith, from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. In 1 Corinthians 11.4, Paul warned about those who would preach a different Jesus or a different gospel. This warning seems applicable to the LDS doctrines. The gospel is the good news that through Christ's death and resurrection, he has redeemed all those who place their faith in his sacrifice, not in their own efforts. So this brings us to point four. What is the goal of eternal life? Is it praising God or creating my own worlds? The Christian looks forward to spending eternity with God, his creator and savior. John wrote in Revelations 4, 9 through 11, whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. Mormons have often said to me that the idea of just sitting around singing praises sounds very boring with no purpose or activity. In the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, we read, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints teaches that all resurrected and perfected mortals become gods. They will dwell again with God the Father and live and act like him in endless worlds 
of happiness, power, love, glory, and knowledge. Above all, they will have the power of procreating endless lives. Latter-day Saints believe that Jesus Christ attained godhood and that he marked the path and led the way for others likewise to become exalted divine beings by following him. And that's in volume two of the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, page 553, in case anyone wants to go check it out. Thus, faithful Mormons look forward to procreating millions of spirit children in order to eventually make their own worlds. And the cycle of spirits, fallen worlds, redemption, and exaltation continues forever. But Paul looked forward to a glorious eternity with God. In 1 Corinthians 2.9, he wrote, But just as it is written, things that no, one, no eye has seen or ear heard or mind imagined are the things God has prepared for those who love him. We don't know the details of heaven, but we trust the creator of the universe to have something even better than earth life. Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 4 through 9, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even we were dead in trans transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. Thank you. Questions I can answer. That's the operative word here. <laughs> I don't think I followed that. How do they what? How do they reconcile Joseph Smith's life since he was married to others or he had, I guess he took on wives that were already married? They don't have an answer for that. And this is one of the problems with uh, Joseph Smith's polygamy. Um, uh, okay, 10 years ago, uh, if you took a poll, what was the major concern of people losing confidence in Mormonism, probably the top thing would have been problems with the Book of Abraham. In today's world, if you took that poll, I think you would find the majority of people questioning Mormonism are struggling with the concept of Joseph's polygamy. Not that they didn't know about polygamy before, but they didn't have the awareness of polyandry. And polyandry is a woman having more than one husband. The Doctrine and Covenants, section 132, that told Joseph he could take 10 virgins, says virgins. If there's nothing in it that gives allowance for Joseph marrying married women. And yet even the church admits on their website, on their Gospel Topics essays on uh, Nauvoo polygamy, they admit that Joseph had, first they admit he had 30 to 40 plural wives. They admit that 12 to 14 of them had living husbands. That's a third of his wives had other husbands. So if one is going to argue that polygamy was ta to take care of uh, poor uh, women that had no other chance of getting married or widows or whatever, no. 
There was no reason to take these 12 to 14 women. And the fact that they would say 12 to 14 tells me it's 14. Um, but there's no justification even in the revelation for this because it says if a man has 10 virgins, not if he just has 10 wives or women. Uh, some of the husbands knew, some didn't. Some were Mormons, some weren't. Uh, some, the wife stayed with the man even after Joseph's death, but then they went on and married Brigham Young or Heber C. Kimball or somebody, and it just, it becomes this, um, I don't know, sort of a free-for-all on <laughs> who you're married to, but they don't have a good reason for Joseph marrying married women. And because of that, as the awareness of that has grown, it has caused a lot of disturbance to Mormons when they've read about this and become aware of it because they realize it, is not, it isn't even by Mormon standard approved in the Doctrine and Covenants. So I'd say the average Mormon doesn't know they had married women as wives. And when they do, they just have to say, uh, well, God will work it all out. And I said, well, yeah, God will work everything out, you know, but that, that doesn't make it right. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Um, I hope this isn't too far off topic, but I've done a little bit of reading about this claim in the way you were sick study from the mm -hmm. Well, how does one do linguistic studies on something where you don't have the original language? We can do studies on the New Testament because you can go back and look at the Greek. But all we have is English for the Book of Mormon. And so they can surmise what might have been behind it, but there's no documents behind it. It's just whatever Joseph Smith wrote down. Now their scholars do studies on uh, trying to develop what, how the theology works out in the Book of Mormon, but they can't do word studies because there is no language to go back to other than you can say, well, this is the way English was used in his day. Um, the problem there is the Book of Mormon doesn't teach current Mormon doctrine, so it's pretty hard to do word studies that are going to help him any because it says that the Father, Son, Holy Ghost is one God, and it's pretty clear <laughs> on that. Uh, that makes a problem for them. They can't say, well, in Greek or Hebrew, it meant this or that or the other. They're stuck. English says the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is one God. So you have that problem with a lot of doctrines through the Book of Mormon. They have a lot of scholars doing research on the Book of Mormon, but it's not of the type and caliber of people studying the New Testament who are looking at thousands of early manuscripts in Greek to determine how the words were used and what the meanings were in the setting of that day. That's word studies. So they have no comparable thing for the Book of Mormon. They, they don't have any good answers for that because of the, as Joseph developed the idea of eternal marriage, then it followed that, well, like you, they wondered, well, did Jesus get married? And that's why in Brigham Young's day that the different apostles did teach that Jesus got married and Mary and Martha were his wives. Uh, Mary Magdalene was a wife. The women at the cross were all his wives other than his mother. And there, I mean, there's sermons on this, and I mentioned some of this in the talk 
last week on Jesus, and I talk about their belief that he achieved godhood and that he was married. It would follow that he was. In fact, there, it, there is writings in the LDS church that speak of the apostles, some of the apostles having the bloodline of Jesus because they believe he had children, <laughs> which from a Mormon perspective, you know, you go, oh, okay, I can see how that would be. Uh, but there's nothing historically, of course, to show anything that way. But it, it does lead to that. Why wouldn't he have been married and have seed, if that's the whole point for everybody else? If they want to argue that uh, Jesus got baptized, therefore we need to follow him and get baptized. If Joseph Smith's going to argue Jesus was a savior because he saw his father be a savior on another world, then it would follow if Heavenly Father was married that Jesus had to be married. If you have to be married, then you are following what Jesus set an example and it would seem to follow he had to be married. So I don't see how you get away from that concept. But today they won't talk about it. They hardly even talk about Heavenly Mother, let alone Jesus being married. Aaron's going to... You were born. What were your thoughts on progression between kingdoms? And, and if you didn't believe in progression between kingdoms, what was the rationale for that? Well, back in my teen years, uh, all Mormon doctrine rose and set with Joseph Fielding Smith. <laughs> And Mormons all read Doctrines of Salvation and Answers to Gospel Questions. And in there, he says there's no progression from kingdom to kingdom. Now, that's speculated on by Mormons at BYU today, whether or not one could progress from one kingdom to the other. Uh, but I think generally the church teaches that once you go through judgment, that you are set in one kingdom or the other. And that's the way I was taught that once you got assigned to the celestial, terrestrial, or celestial, you could progress in that kingdom in your knowledge and uh, service, whatever, but you could never move from, for instance, the terrestrial to the celestial. You had your chance during the thousand year reign of Christ, and if you accepted their work for the dead and accepted temple ritual, then you got to go up to the celestial kingdom. But if you didn't do it during the thousand year reign, you were stuck and you had to stay in a particular kingdom. I'm just glad that the gospel's real simple. <laughs> I don't have to worry about all these things. <laughs> okay. Now, if they got them, otherwise we might be through. <laughs> Yeah. Does the Book of Mormon talk about this uh, battle in the free? No, the Book of Mormon has nothing about uh, uh, war in heaven. Uh, the Book of Mormon talks about uh, God being eternal, uh, about the earth being God's creation. He's the creator of all things. There's nothing of this eternal progression idea in the Book of Mormon, which is why the missionaries take the Book of Mormon to people when they are proselyting it is the closest to their Christian understanding uh, out of all their books of scripture. And uh, you aren't gonna bump up against some doctrine that sounds strange like uh, God uh, having uh, progressed to godhood or anything. So uh, Mormons will come into the store and say to me, oh, Mrs. Tanner, I just wanna know, did you ever read the Book of Mormon and did you pray about it? And I tell them, yes, I read the Book of Mormon a number of times and I prayed about it. God told me it wasn't true. <laughs> and then they say, well, I didn't pray right. Um, but then I asked them as a follow-up, okay, well, let's just take a, a, a thought here. Suppose I were to read the Book of Mormon and pray about it and determine that it was true. What doctrine do you think I would have to change in accepting the Book of Mormon as true. Because I don't think it would accomplish what you think it would. Simply believing the Book of Mormon would not mean that I would believe in eternal marriage or eternal progression 
temple work, work for the dead, three levels of heaven, because none of those are in the Book of Mormon. So my challenge to the Mormon is, maybe you need to read the Book of Mormon and study what it actually teaches, because the doctrine in it is not the doctrine of the Doctrine and Covenants, which is why when Gerald and I left Mormonism, we hung on to the Book of Mormon for three more years as non-Mormons, because we thought, well, maybe God really did restore this book through Joseph Smith, and he got a big head and jumped ahead of God and started off into some funny stuff all on his own, but we could believe just the Book of Mormon because we could see Jesus in it. There is enough New Testament quoted in the Book of Mormon <laughs> that what one can see Christ there. Uh, but then as the years went by, uh, Gerald became troubled by the fact that there was so much of the New Testament in the Book of Mormon that obviously the Nephites would have had to have had access to a King James Bible <laughs> to have written the Book of Mormon because it, it, the phrasing is all English King James Bible through it and phrases, the concepts from Paul that are through the Book of Mormon, how could they be there when they're uh, a total different continent Hundreds of years removed from each other, uh, the, Mormon, the Book of Mormon people came at 600 BC to America. They, they can't have the influence of Jesus' day, and they certainly never read Paul. And so how do they get all these phrases in the Book of Mormon? And as those troubled us and we started to think more seriously about why do we believe the Book of Mormon? What is the evidence for this book? Why would we take it as being true alongside the Bible Get, by then, we'd studied a little bit on the Bible, and hey, my Bible's got maps in the back. This one does not have maps. If it were real history, they ought to be able to decide on the location, at least one. And they can't decide on any one location. Then you cannot talk of archaeology, any evidences of hard fact or you would know someplace a Nephite stood, and you could say, well, at least we know he was right here. But they have nothing. Uh, and as we studied on the Bible and we studied on the Book of Mormon, we realized the Book of Mormon was echoing things out of the Bible, that it was a 19th century invention to parade as the Word of God, but in fact, it was a poor imitation of the real thing. And so we finally set the Book of Mormon aside and went back to just the Bible. I think I need prayer. Because <laughs> this makes me angry. <laughs> uh, yes. Pray for grace. <laughs> hey, that went up here. Lucky me. Yeah. I'm sitting here thinking I'm not even sure how to ask the question. But is there anything especially in old writings of early Mormon apostles. It seems like, okay, Godhood is a state of being. And the Bible is pretty clear, Judeo Christian, whatever, that, you know, it talks about the nature of God mm -hmm. and falls under this state of being. And then you have this Mormon concept of men, I can explain that to you, but men going from a state of being of not God to God. Mm -hmm. Cross a line, you know, and go through the car wash at the other end of God. Yeah. Has anybody ever written about what that process is? Is it ordination? Is it way of the magic wand? Is it a mystery? It's one of the mysteries. No one ever uh, uh, can say a real position on this because Joseph didn't live long enough to flesh out all of his doctrine. And so he left a lot of loose ends. For instance, why did the Holy Ghost not have to get a body? If all of us had to get a body, and the devil was short circuit on his ability to progress because he didn't get a body, how does the Holy Ghost get there without one? And he still doesn't have one. Which is why some polygamous groups argue that Joseph Smith was the Holy Ghost come to get his body <laughs> in trying to resolve this. Uh, there are some of the uh, Mormon feminists that, that would even argue that the Holy Ghost is really Heavenly Mother. Uh, 
but she already would have got a body from another Earth experience, so it just becomes a real problem. There just is not any answers. Uh, there's a lot of loose ends in Mormon theology that they just have to table and say as one of the mysteries. Uh, and the theology changed from 1830 to 1844. Joseph Smith revamped his whole doctrinal platform. Almost everything changed. The definitions of almost everything changed over 14 years. Um, and so you can pick and choose which period you want to say, well, he was right here, no, he was right up to now, then he was right up to here. And so you have all these splinter groups that pick different points at which Joseph went astray. And then you get to Brigham Young and you got groups that say, when the church went astray after him, uh, was it that the manifesto? Was it when they get preached to the blacks? You know, and so you have all these different splinter groups of Mormonism because it is a very loose doctrinal base and you can just come up with any number of variants of belief systems depending on what period you're reading. It makes it very confusing. Oh. Why don't we use Sandra again?